Money. He talked about it a lot. And there are a lot of people that he encountered who are living under the gravity and the weight of a broken economic cycle. This morning we encounter a young man who's doing life on the gravel truck. Historically we've called this young man the rich young ruler. Who comes to Jesus with this profound question. And it's a good question. Rabbi, teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He's got a question mark on his soul. And he fights his way to Jesus. We don't know how long he had to travel or how he even heard about Jesus or where he had to come from. But we know that he finds Jesus and he asks this question. And isn't that really the question that all human beings have on our soul? How do we have the life that's eternal life? This is a man who has everything. He's wealthy. He's got all the stuff that the world tells him he should have. But yet there's still there's something lacking. There, there's a void, there's a hole that the stuff and the money and the wealth doesn't fill. And so he knows the right one to go to. He comes to Jesus with this question. Amen? Amen. What do I have to do to inherit eternal life? You know, unfortunately, what we do in the West is we make eternal life and resurrection and the kingdom of God all about some escape hatch kind of next world kind of reality, right? We talk about one, by, one day, by and by, by in the sky, I'll fly away with Jesus, like some soul to some pillowy, uh, harp playing heaven kind of scenario. But when Jesus talks about the kingdom of God, when Jesus talks about eternal life, when Jesus talks about resurrection, he's not talking about life beyond death. He's talking about a life that begins now. Amen. Amen. He's talking about a new kind of life that begins right here, today, this day. Salvation has come to this house. He comes in the Gospel of John to Martha when Lazarus has been in the tomb for three days. And she says, yes, Lord, I know one day, by and by, you'll resurrect my brother from death. And Jesus says, no, you don't get it. I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me will never die, and even though they die, they'll live. I'm going to resurrect your brother right now. Yes. Roll that stone away. Let's deal with the stinky stuff in there. I am the resurrection and the life. Bring it. When Jesus talks about the kingdom of God, he's not talking about something just that's a future reality, but also a present reality. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth yes. as it is in heaven right now in my life, in your life, in the life of the church. Eternal life is not just about something that we hope for one day by and by. It's something that we start to live into now. And Jesus uh, in answers this man who's looking for that kind of life, the life that's truly life. And he says, you know what to do. If you wish to enter into life, notice what he says there. He doesn't say, uh, if you wish to, when you die, go to heaven. Uh, or when you die, go to some other kind of scenario. He says, if you wish to enter life, oh, what do we do to enter life? What do we do to enter the life that's truly life? He says, do this. Keep the commandments. You know what the Lord says. The Shema, hero Israel, the Lord your God is one God. Have no other God before me. Worship the Lord your God. Have no idols. Love God. Love your neighbor. Don't rob. Don't steal. Don't kill. Don't commit adultery. You know what to do. And amazingly, like no one in this room, this young man says, I've kept all those things, Lord. I've actually done that. <laughs> or at least he thinks he has, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> and the young man says, I've done all that. What do I still lack? Right? And, and I've got all the stuff of life. I've got the things and the homes and the wealth. And, and I've got all those things. What do I still lack? And Jesus says, if you wish to be perfect. Now that's a really bad translation of, of the Greek word, and it can be uh, translated in that way. But the word there is teleos, from where we get the word you might be familiar with, to telestai. Someone got that tattooed on their forearm at Tattoo Parlor Church last week. To telestai, which is what Jesus proclaims from the cross, which means it is finished. We have one person who reads their Bible. 
So the word teleos, from where we get the word to telestai, is not about perfection in the sense of our Western idea of, I'm perfect, put a plaque on the wall, I've achieved it. But it's this idea of completeness. Finished. I've done the work the Father said before me, Jesus says. It's about being whole. A human being made in the image of God that's achieved this uh, place of wholeness and completeness. And Jesus says, if you want to achieve that, if you want to be teleos, go and sell your possessions and give the money to the poor. Now, somebody just took a really big swallow in the house this morning. <laughs> Gulp, right? Uh -huh. We did this in Wednesday night Bible study, and somebody just immediately said, I don't like this. I do not like this guy. Can we do something else? Can we go to another place in the Bible? Right? Go and sell everything you have and give it to the poor. And someone that raised one of our astute Bible scholars in our Wednesday night Bible study raised a really good question. They said, does that mean that all of us are supposed to give all our stuff away to the poor? That doesn't really make sense, Pastor, because then we wouldn't have anything to give and we wouldn't be able to live if we all did that, right? Now understand that, that Jesus deals with each person that he encounters individually, right? And our Wesleyan understanding really is earn all you can, save all you can, so you can yeah. give all you can. That coffee's finally kicking in for y'all. <laughs> so we need to be industrious. We need to work. We need to use this sin-broken system Jesus tells us to earn entrance into heavenly dwellings. We need to save all we can and invest all we can and get... You know, it comes down to the, the parable that Jesus talks about. One person had three talents, another person had five talents, another seven. Some invested and made this bigger impact, right? And if we're wise about that, and we live in the, the tension of that gravity, where we have to live in this sin-broken world, but not let it suck us to the floor or the wall, right? And we use our money for the kingdom of God. So not everybody's supposed to go sell all their stuff and give it to the poor, but this man does. Because Jesus sees sitting on the throne of his heart is not God, but his stuff. And in order for this man to get out of the ground trunk, he's going to have to go and sell everything he has and give it to the poor. And then he can experience life with true life. Then he can know the freedom Amen. that only Jesus can do. Now just think about like if this man actually did this, he would be like the 13th disciple. Come on. Think about it. I mean, we might have like five Gospels written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and this dude. <laughs> like he throws open the door to the ground and he says, come on, have this life. It's truly life. Sell all your stuff. Yeah, that sounds kind of like a hurdle that I might have a little struggle with overcoming that. Would you? Amen? Amen. But think about it, if he did and he got free and he came out of the ground and he's like, I'm going to follow you, Jesus, wherever you go. And maybe he would have been there at the cross with John and Mary. Maybe he would have been down at the empty tomb when Jesus was raised up from death. Oh, I'm preaching and God really ain't responding. It's okay. <laughs> he says, you want to take this and give it to the poor. i got to tell you, folks, that, that Jesus, God, all through Scripture, has a deep concern for the poor and the marginalized and the orphans yes. and the widows. Yes. And it is one of the reasons that the church exists is to take care of people that are experiencing poverty. Yes. It's what Jesus says in Matthew 25. If you feed the hungry, if you clothe the naked, if you give drink to the thirsty, if you welcome the stranger, if you visit the inmates, if you care for the sick, then what you've done unto the least of these, you've done unto me. What if we were able to see people that were experiencing poverty as Christ Himself and treat them like we would treat Jesus? Right? In the church, that's, that's one of our primary goals. See, we live in this sin-broken economic system that is not God's design for human community at all. If you look at Genesis and you look at Revelation, you see God's design for human community, right? And it looks like this. We walk with God in the cool of the day. We are naked and unashamed. Yes. There's no guilt. There's no shame. There's none of those forces of gravity on our souls. Amen. We go with God. We walk with God. And God says, 
You are the crowning gem of my creation, fearfully and wonderfully made, male and female in the image of God. Go forth and be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. It's all yours. The universe is your playground. I want you to be my reflections that take care of creation. I want you to take care of the animals and the fish of the sea and the trees and, and this beautiful world that I give you, including Nick, because it's his birthday. <laughs> This is all yours, and I want you to be stewards. See, in God's design, we don't own anything. It all belongs to God. Amen. We are stewards of what God has given us. And for a brief time, you don't take any of your stuff with you. Just ask John Rockefeller or any of the other the super wealthy people that have lived in our world. You don't get to take it. And Jesus is about to tell this man what he can do to earn true riches. And when we live in society, we live in this sin-broken uh, economy. As we all rush out of church today to go to the all-you-can-eat buffet, do you know that there are children who will die of starvation? Because in this kind of system, when we have too much, others have not. And God creates this beautifully, fearfully, wonderfully made universe where everybody has enough. And everybody gets their little piece of the land to work it and to till it and to keep it and to be stewards over it. But our society teaches us we have to store, we have to hoard, we have to have more. How much do we need? Just a little more. Right? But God's created human community in a way that that's not the way it's supposed to look. But we've been in the Gravitron so long, that has become our reality. And we don't realize that God's throwing open the door and saying, you don't have to live in debt. You don't have to live in the impulse of what's the next thing that I have to have. You don't have to live by those standards of the world. You don't have to be conformed to the patterns of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, Paul tells us. And Jesus tells this young man, go and sell yourself to the poor, and then you'll have treasures in heaven. Now, what do those treasures in heaven look like? I'm sure it's not going to be a stockpile of Benjamin Franklin's or gold, right? I mean, in heaven, gold's going to be like what the streets are paved with. Amen? Amen. If you come with gold in your pocket, Peter's not going to let you in the gate, right? <laughs> when he's talking about treasures in heaven, what does he mean? It's not going to be we got a big bank account with gold stored up in our house, right? Jesus says, use this worldly manhood. Turn entrance for yourself into heavenly dwellings. That's what true treasures are. When we learn to invest and to give and to make an impact in this world, it'll have an echo in the next. And when we walk into that new creation, we see the great harvest of souls that have been won and touched by our giving. We will see the faces of the ones who were fed to our giving. We will see the faces of the ones who were clothed through our offerings. We will see the impact that the way we lived in this world has transformed the next. The cups of cold water that become the cascades of grace that are the rivers of life in the new creation. Amen. You'll have true treasures, Jesus says. But what does the rich young man do? He gets back in the gravel time, doesn't he? He turns around and he's fully under the weight of his stuff. His head shrugged down, his shoulders pressing in on him. Because in all reality, his wealth is more important than his relationship with God. And it's his stuff that sits on the throne of his heart. Not his relationship with Jesus. And this young man, like many Christians who sit in church every Sunday and rob God, decides to get back in the crapper job and shut the door and go back to life as usual. Over the next couple weeks, we're going to invite you to live into a new kind of freedom. Okay, are you with me? I want to show you a little video. Sometimes God gives us these devices, instruments, if you will, and we're going to close with this, on um, how to defy gravity. Um, and one of those gravity-defying uh, uh, tools is the swing. For those of you that don't know what the heck a gravitron is, do you remember a swing? <laughs> right? So you get on the swing and you push your legs forward and you bring your legs back and you push.
push your leg forward, and, and ultimately, once you really start going, right? Forgive me, I spent a lot of time around kids, okay? <laughs> once you really start going, you can feel that, that weightlessness when you get to the top of the swing, right? And you come pull back in. How many of y'all go to the playground once in a while? Okay, amen. <laughs> Uh, and you can feel the, the loss of gravity as the swing helps you kind of defy that gravity. So I want to show you a son video of my son Alex doing something epic. Watch this. And then he wipes out. <laughs> So did you see what he did there? <laughs> By the way, I did not authorize that. I was turned the other way when he did that. Uh, and I would never do anything like that myself. <laughs> but did you notice what he did there? So when he gets all the way to the back of the swing, he's pulling back, kind of leaning back, at the same time kicking out his legs. So what we're going to do over the next couple of weeks is we're going to ask you to lean back into the arms of Jesus. We're going to ask you to lean back into the traditions of the church, the faith that's been passed down for 2,000 years. Lean back into your trust of God and simultaneously kick your legs forward. Then you get to this point and when you do swing jumping, not that I would know about this, where you just have to release and you have to trust God. Amen. And maybe just for a moment, maybe just for a passing moment before you wipe out, <laughs> you defy gravity. And we're going to invite you to get out of the gravity trap to defy gravity as you lean back, trusting in Jesus, and flying forward through an act of faith. Yes. We're going to ask you to evaluate your financial lives. We're going to ask you to take a good hard look at the cycles of consumerism that you live in. We're going to ask you to go home, look around your house. Are there clothing that you don't wear anymore that you don't need? Guess what? we got some folks right here that fill this room on Fridays that could use that clothing. Are there things in your house that don't really, you don't need them? They're just cluttering down, weighing you down in the garbage truck? Have a yard sale. Declutter your lives. Get free. Sell the stuff at the yard sale, then bring it and put it in the box on Sunday mornings. Amen. Sit down with your finances and look at your budget. How much money do you spend on stuff? Going out to eat. Things that really aren't needs but wants. And are there places where you can cut, where you can sow more into the kingdom of God? where you can bless others, where you can escape the weight of that gravity. i got to tell you, there's no greater freedom in your life than to live in a place where you have no debt, to live in a place where you can give generously and it feels good. And it's my hope for every one of you that we can all get to that place together. If you need help, say, I don't know how to make a budget. I don't know how to do those kind of things. Talk to me. Amen. Talk to some of the other, we have finance people in this church, and that's what they do. They're specialized in that. We can help you with that. We can show you how to make a budget, how to do a debt elimination plan, and those kind of things. That's what the church is here for, to help you to grow into the fullness of the image of Jesus and to live in that true freedom that Christ has for you. So what are we going to do, church? Are we going to defy gravity? Yes. Are we going to jump out of the swing together? Yes. Are we going to experience the weightlessness of life outside the gravitron? Or are you going to, like that rich young ruler, go back in and shut the door and be stuck to the wall for the rest of your life? Every time we come to the table, this is the table where God defies gravity. This is where God takes the weight, the gravity of our guilt and shame and lifts it off of us. This is the place where we can come just as we are and say, Jesus, I have not loved you with all my heart, soul, and mind and strength. I've not been faithful in my resources, but I want to have a new start. I want to have a new beginning. 
This is the place where we can get honest with God. This is the place where Jesus is throwing open the door to the gravel truck Amen. and saying, come out. There's a better life. There's a better way. And it starts right here. And the good news is this morning, there's room at this table for you. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord.